welcome to today's edition of Hashtag The African Dream. Today we have for our special guest, Ambassador Kip E. Tom. Ambassador Kip E. Tom served as the United States Ambassador to the United Nations Agencies for Food and Agriculture and Chief of the United States Mission to the UN Agencies in Rome from 2019 to 2021. The United Nations has six different food and agriculture development agencies. The U.S. has significant involvement with the Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO. As a result, there is political and economic staff from the State Department of the United States, as well as staff from the USDA, that's the United States Department of Agriculture, and the U.S. Agency for International Development. Today, like I already said, Ambassador Kip Tom is our special guest on Hashtag The African Dream Show. Welcome, Mr. Ambassador. Oral, thank you so much for uh, having me on the show today. I tell you what, it's it's one of the things after returning from mission in Rome and, and spending as much time as I did uh, in a developing world, and most of that time in Africa, of course, was it, it's good to continue to see some of the efforts moving forward. And uh, I still today, uh, two years later, still am engaged in a number of activities uh, across the continent trying to make a difference because uh, I believe in the people on the continent of, of Africa. And I saw firsthand the, the interest, the willingness, the, the ability to work hard, and, and especially around the youth and women and some of the, the engagement level of activities that they want to be involved in to improve food security and create those economic opportunities for others and themselves uh, on the continent of Africa. So I'm very optimistic longer term, but uh, there are some concerns that we have along the way as well. It's interesting, you mentioned food security, which is going to be the staple of our interview dish today, no pun intended. <laughs> now, uh, what are the main objectives of US food policy in Africa? Well, I think the one of, one of the main focuses uh, as we, as the United States and our contribution to the World Food Program, we're typically, usually in that 40% of that total budget. Sometimes uh, this past year, we were nearly 50% 50, 50 of that budget that was nearly or a little bit over $14 billion. The main goal is to respond with capacity and compassion around the world where food security is an issue. And uh, we know with climate issues, we know with uh, population growth, we know with uh, uh, one of the biggest drivers is man-made conflict today. Uh, as I look across the Sahel of Africa, all of the civil conflicts and the, what that, that is doing to the people and their ability to feed themselves and grow their economy. So uh, it was very important for the United States to become involved with this. It was not only, uh, it was the security of those nations as well too. We know if, if, if they're not food secure, they're gonna become unstable and we know what happens when people aren't fed. They migrate usually typically three times within their nation, then they move outside and then they get caught up in human trafficking, illicit drug trade and arms movement and worst case scenario, someone get involved in extremist activities. So uh, it's important that we're involved there, but, but, but the reality is we have failed in the past to really serve our role in development. Uh, to me, development is where it's at. It shouldn't be in handing out food. I would much rather show people how to grow their own food, create those economic opportunities so they can you know, see that move out of that cycle of poverty that so many are in and get involved in having the ability to live the lives they need to live, You know, the standards of lives, or whether it's uh, being able to send their children off to college someday or get the medical care that they deserve. Those are the things we want to instill. And this is why the United States is so focused on development. And we give significantly. I think uh, if we look at the continent as a whole and development side, we, we probably put over $10 billion there in the last six, seven years. And uh, we ask very little for that, where we see some other nations come in and they leverage their 10 billion and try to gain control of the nations, whether it's in natural resources and, and uh, some of their products there. So to, to us in the United States, uh, we wanna be humanitarians first, but we wanna be developing too, helping people feed themselves. That's interesting. Um, how does, quickly, how does the United States collaborate with UN agencies for food um, and agriculture to address food related challenges in Africa? 
Well, I think, you know, the, the first one is, is always through the World Food Program. That's the, that is the most significant organization within the UN system. Uh, it is one where they, they actually go out and identify the needs around the world in those different places where there's humanitarian crises and make sure that food is delivered to them so we don't have people slipping into famine. Uh, the other organization was the Food and Agriculture Organization. This is the organization that uh, has about 194 ambassadors represented within the organization led by Q Dongju. And, and it is the one that should be instilling the ability to increase resilience and increase capacity in food systems in the developing world. And quite frankly, I would say this in the past, uh, they haven't done either one of those because uh, we haven't seen uh, the vast changes that we need to see in, in uh, African agriculture on the continent. You know, Africa's got about uh, 1.1 billion uh, hectares of arable land. And I, I think as we look at that and we look at the United States, we only got 158 million. I think China's got a, maybe around 125, 130 million uh, uh, arable hectares of land. But the reality is there's so much capacity in Africa that could be utilized to not only feed themselves, but to feed many others around the world. And, uh, you know, knowing the population growth that's in place, we know that Nigeria in itself is going to be the third largest country in the world by 2050, we understand. It's time we get really focused on that development and try to make sure that the changes in the future are in store for Africa, the continent of Africa. I'll say this, though. This is one thing we've been doing since I came home, is we, we always tend to lean on what we've always done in the past, and that was to count on the UN system to deliver uh, the ability to increase capacity uh, and resilience. I'm now a believer it's up to the private sector. You know, the private sector who has, uh, they have the innovations, they have the intellectual property, they have the capital, they have the where for all, the knowledge, and they have the people. And it's one of my goals is to see the private sector come in and make those changes in Africa to really make sure it happens. Because I think once it gets handed off the UN, there's so much slippage and there's political agendas and ideology that gets involved. And to me, it's taking in the private sector, let them work with people. Yeah, hopefully they make money, but you know, when they make money, they reinvest it back into the country and they grow the business there. So that's right. Um, that's right. That's one thing we're focused on. Right. It's um it's interesting you mentioned the fact that Africa has um one of the largest, if not the largest, um arable land for agricultural purposes on earth. And you mentioned uh the engagement of private sector, which uh it's obvious that Africa has a very vibrant and robust private sector. And then you mentioned something else. You mentioned China. What um um um, um if I may ask, why does the US believe China is trying to exploit Africa's agricultural potential for itself. Um, what instances are there to prove this? Yeah, if, if you re read my recent uh, opinion piece on this, it's, it's my belief in, in my time in Africa, my time at the FAO, time at the World Food Program, time spent in the international four of meetings uh, around the world looking at uh, the continent of Africa and the different investment segments that are coming in there. We've watched China's behavior mainly on coming in and picking up some of the debt that may be being created in a, in a nation within the, on the continent of Africa that maybe they had a World Bank loan to build bridges or roads or dams or some kind of infrastructure. And then they weren't able to meet that need. And then we saw China come in and buy that debt out for a very small amount of money, but then leverage the government to try to clap collect the, some of the uh, principal and the interest on that. And it puts them into a debt spiral to where then the, the African nation has to pledge or promise uh, access to uh, reserves. Uh, maybe it's minerals, maybe it's, uh, you know, precious metals, whatever it may be. We've seen that, but, you know, I've witnessed the Chinese Communist Party, not the Chinese people. The Chinese people, I think, are, are good people. But when it comes down to the Chinese Communist Party, there's no doubt their standards and their expectations for humanity, the caring of people is much different than those that you, I think you values that you and I share. And so that's one of my concerns. So I, I see China looking at Africa, not so much for the minerals and the, 
the mining and the natural resources they're coming after. I think they're looking more at the ability to use Africa as their breadbasket, which is fine, but let's make sure that they're doing it in a way that's good enough for the, the people on the continent of Africa. I want to see the people of Africa have the, the potential to have the economic growth that they deserve. You know, I want to see young people come into the world of agriculture and food and be able to thrive on their own without the, the oversight of the Chinese Communist Party. So um, I, I think it's time that we in the United States take a strong diplomatic position and make sure we support the different countries in Africa. You know, before I finish this little comment out, I want to say this. Sure. We know that a country's power is based upon four different elements. And those elements are diplomatic, informational, economic, and military. I will say that there's another element to that. And that other element is that secure for a country to be a, a world power and is they have to have food and energy. If you don't have food and energy, how do we, none of any of us exist? So this is why I think when Africa, or excuse me, when the Chinese look at Africa, they're looking at, we need to be food secure ourselves. We don't want to count on trade with Brazil or Argentina or the United States or Canada or Australia. We want to control it in Africa and we want to be in control of Africa. And I think Africa needs to be controlled by the African nations, not by the Chinese Communist Party. Right. Um... Uh, there's this um, perennial problem in respective African countries to do with um, energy. You mentioned energy. Um, for agriculture to, uh, agriculture to be successful across the continent, we need um, uh, a reliable supply of energy to power some of the machines that till the land, some of the machines that can um, produce the product and add values to it. And just regular energy supply in respective offices and agencies that have to do with agriculture. Um, this perennial problem, which I uh, mentioned, uh, is the fact that we don't have constant or reliable supply of energy across some African countries. Take Ghana and Nigeria, for instance. There's this um, perennial um, load shedding, which deprives um, the citizens of um, continued uh, or reliable power supply. It's called Doomsor in Ghana. I don't know if you've heard of it, but um, Nigerians call it some other names. Um, China and U.S. have interest in Africa, um, uh, but we, we, we don't see them looking at some of these major problems like energy supply. You know, um, there's a case um, that some African countries may find China's strategy on food security in Africa more promising compared to U.S. approach. Um, what do you say to this? Yeah, I, I can see how it's, it maybe is explained in that manner, but uh, I know in some conversations I've had with uh, trade uh, secretaries here in the United States in the past administration, and they have a focus on saying, what can we do to increase trade with, with Africa, the continent of Africa, you know, to where they have the opportunity to get more value out of their products than they're getting today. And I think you'll see different behaviors. I mean, one only has to watch how a democracy functions compared to a, a totalitarian system or a, a, what we see oftentimes in, uh, in China. And uh, so I, I think you'd see us behave in a much different way. We wanna make sure we're fair on that trade. We want to make sure that there's non trade tariff barriers in there. But uh, there's no doubt to me, Africa has the capacity to export. But I think, you know, the way the United States looks at it versus China looks at it is much different. Like I said, we have both, as two different nations, have contributed probably 10 billion into China, or excuse me, into Africa over the last past six, seven years. The reality is we have different expectations with what we contribute compared to what they contribute. Uh, we see oftentimes they displace African workers. They bring in their own workforce. We don't want to do that at all. We would rather bring in people to train and train the trainers to let the African people do it themselves, create those jobs there. Um, we know this is all about economic development and a, a food secure and ec economically secure Africa that stands on their own, not being propped up by the United States, not being propped up by China is a much better continent for the African people.
Right, and I, and I totally agree. Um, you've um, made some very interesting and positive remarks about um, how the U.S. wants to see Africa get a fairer um, end of the deal and um, a, a fairer end that uh, empowers the continent and its respective countries where they can um, have an equal share um, at the table when it comes to the uh, food security and um, enhancing agriculture in Africa to eventually make Africa the breadbasket, not just of the West, but importantly um, for Africans as well. Um, you've also said uh, things that um, shows uh, what the uh, Americans are doing to help improve uh, relationship uh, with Africa when it comes to food security and agriculture. But um, where do you think the US agriculture and food security policy in Africa is lagging? Um, I know this is a little bit of a, uh, <laughs> a tough question, but I'm sure you can answer that. And uh, what are the possible solutions to fix these um, inconsistencies or negativities? I think, I'll be honest with you, I think we've just ignored African society. I'll be honest with you, it's, it's a fault of ours. Yet I know I have some friends over there right now are trying to do some trade deals with, uh, with uh, in Kenya, Tanzania, uh, some others in, in uh, where was it? I think it was uh, Rwanda. So I know that today people are being a little more open and going into Africa and saying, what can we do to work together here? Uh, for instance, I believe it was avocados out of uh, Kenya uh, was the latest one I heard. We're seeing some increased trade there. So I think it's, it's behooving on us uh, as Americans to be proactive to go out and create this trade. And at the same time, try to bring in that partnership. If we come in, I, I can tell you where I could bring workers over because we, we don't have enough workers to fill the jobs we have here in the United States, but we would just as soon help train some of your people how to do it. Let you own the business, let you run the business and trade with whoever you want to in a world. We just hope we can be a part of that trade. And if you can uh, own that trade yourself and sell it to China, good for you. I, uh, that's that's good. I just you know I just want to stand in front of China owning Africa is what it amounts to. Mm -hmm. uh, Africa needs to be owned by the African people, and you need to recognize the value of it. But you know we see civil conflict in so many places. You know I was in <clears throat> I was in Sudan back in March. And one thing was obvious when we were there, we seen this mining group all over the place and it was the Wagner group out of Russia. You know, I don't know if they were paying anything for these leases, but they were mining gold to sell to help fund the war. Um, that's lack of uh, the Western world getting engaged in Africa. And I, I think, I think quite honestly, we just, uh, we haven't paid the attention to the continent of Africa that we need to. We, we tend to measure we tend to measure success by how much we contribute and not by the outcome. And I think it's important for us to make sure that we get out there and, and we do what's best for the continent of Africa, but help, help measure the outcome and help them thrive on their own. Then the day we want to see you be successful. Interesting. You um, um, mentioned that uh, one of the major deficiencies is lack of uh, engagement and uh, not just lack of engagement but lack of proper engagement where you know you 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 send people who understand the situation on the ground and can speak in in collaborative efforts with the people on the ground so we can find ways to provide solutions that will benefit not just um, people in africa but also people in uh, people in america and you know people outside the continent of africa now in in your view how can Africa utilize its agricultural potential to become a significant global food power? Because people are already saying Africa is already a global food power. She just hasn't exploited and explored her potential to the fullest. Yeah, I think it starts out with a number of critical elements. And it was one that I mentioned earlier. It's, it's getting the private sector engaged. But again, the private sector is always hesitant to go into a, a nation that's maybe under civil conflict. And I can't blame them. They're going to be responsible for to shareholders of, you know, why did you go to this country? You lost everything we invested there. So I think it comes down to we've got to see some of these nations that there's corruption, high levels of corruption in, and there's corruption around the world. Don't get me wrong. It's not just Africa. It's everywhere. 
And it, we, we've got to be able to go, come in with, and see the rule of law in place. And once we see the rule of law, we can see that companies can invest and, and see a return on investment. I think you'll see them educate people. You're the people on the continent of Africa. I think you'll see them invest. I think you'll see them bring in the innovations. They hold the intellectual property. They've spent billions in research and development to bring products out. And they really like to offer them into Africa and sell them in Africa and make sure that the people there can really leverage some of those technologies to increase productivity, to produce more than what you need so someday you can export. And I think that's, uh, that's the true opportunity for Africa, especially, as I said, with 1.1 billion hectares of, of arable soils. Uh, there's all kinds of opportunities there. But we've got to have the rule of law in place and we've got to have leaders that are willing to enforce that and make sure they stand by their people and not their own self-interest. I think that's what's probably most critical. Then I think you'll see the investment come in and the handoff to the African people to do what's right. Ambassador Kip, um, it's been a pleasure having you on Hashtag Be African Dream Show. We appreciate your insights on the subject and we look forward to coming back to talk some more on this issue as we watch um, U.S.-Africa um, relations develop with specific um, um, regards to agriculture and the uh, global food economy. Now, is there anything you'd like to say on this subject that you feel everyone must know and learn from? Well, if there's anything I can say is, you know, we, we've done a lot of talking over the last number of decades of, of what should happen in Africa before it's too late, we need to take action. And uh, that's why I'm working with others uh, back here in the United States and from around the world, trying to, in Europe and other places, trying to see what we can do to make sure we can see actionable activities occur, take place, and create those opportunities. But because again, I, the, the population growth that this continent is experiencing, the opportunities with the arable soils you have the global demand that's going to be in place, I, I see great opportunities for the continent of Africa, but we've got to we've got to make sure that we've got everybody engaged, focused, and we have the rule of law in place on the continent. And so, like I said, I have great hope for Africa, but it's going to take our act, action to start now. And I, I challenge the leaders across the continent: do what's right for the people. Because that's that's what they'll be remembered by is what they do right for the people of their country. Do right for the people, and that will be uh, an enduring legacy when you're no more. Uh, you've been around the continent, and I'm sure you've had meals from respective African countries. Um, is there any particular food that you've had anywhere on the continent that reminds you of something similar to what is available in America? It, uh, yes, I have. It was in South Africa. And in the United States, we call it beef jerky. I forget what they call it in South Africa, but it's very similar. But, but the South African version of it is much better. They have so many different flavors, uh, so many different textures. And uh, that's probably one, one of the products. Of course, always all the fruits. Uh, yeah. The fruits in Africa are the best in the world. So, uh, like I said, we just need to make sure we can produce more of them and export them around the world and the money comes back and rewards to different people across the continent of uh, Africa. Thank you, Ambassador. We appreciate you making time. Appreciate your time too. Thank you. In recent years, global acute food insecurity has been rising to a high record due to factors like conflict, climate shocks, and COVID-19, exacerbating the global hunger crisis and driving millions more into extreme poverty. Over 258 million people across 58 countries may suffer from acute food insecurity. In times like this, swift action is critical. But with fragmented data coming from multiple sources, it's incredibly difficult for decision makers to find effective solutions in time. This is where the new Global Food and Nutrition Security Dashboard can help. It aims to inform a coordinated global food crisis response and strengthen resilience against future crises by bringing together the latest information on food crisis severity, 
food security financing and innovative research from various partners of the Global Alliance for Food Security, all publicly accessible in one place. The interactive map allows for the immediate identification of food insecurity hotspots on a global and country level. Individual indicators can be toggled to display different types of food and nutrition insecurity indicators. From here, you can also see an overview of food security financing and links to relevant researches and analysis. For a more in-depth look at each country, you can explore country profiles. They offer more details and trends on national and sub-national food security situation, provide a breakdown of the financing to the country by sector, donor, and overtime, along with any relevant research. All country profiles can also be easily downloaded as a PDF. Lastly, the Resources section has a repository of existing publications, databases, and other relevant resources shared by our partners. With many new features on the horizon, like the rollout of trackable country-led food security crisis preparedness plans later this year, the dashboard is a living platform, continuously updated with new resources and functionality. Putting the data all in one place helps you stay up to date, see solutions and make informed decisions about how to respond to food security crises and build resilient systems. To protect the most vulnerable, we need to keep food moving and invest in the future. To see how your country is doing, find out more at www.gafs.info. Let's take note of this major long-term food security policy plan by the United States. By uh, 2050, it is estimated that the population of this planet could be as uh, many as 10 billion people. Demand for food is likely to increase by 50% over what it is today. And yet, yields, what's actually being produced, are going down, not up. We have to, and we are, addressing this challenge. Um, one of the initiatives the United States is advancing um, that is a vision for adapted uh, crops and soil. And simply put, what that means is this. We know that we have the ability uh, to produce seeds for planting that are resilient, certainly more resilient to climate change in all of its various manifestations, and are much more nutritious than some of the things being planted today. We also know that the quality of soil makes all the difference in the world. And we now have the ability to map pretty much any terrain anywhere in the world to determine the quality of its soil, where it's good, where it's bad, where we can improve it, and how we can improve it. You put those two things together, seeds and soil, and you can powerfully address the challenge of producing sustainable uh, agricultural production capacity with better yields, more nutritious crops in a sustainable way. We are putting $100 million uh, to that effort. Other countries are joining in, uh, and we expect to see significantly more come forward in the uh, weeks and months ahead. This is a powerful new way to really make a difference over the long term in making sure that we have strong agricultural capacity and production around the world, and notably in Africa. 